Hello and welcome. This is Craig with Integrative Systems and today we're going to start a multi-part video of how to set up a Dell Equalogic PS Series storage array. And as you can see we got our first shipment here from Dell. We're looking at the beginning of our switching fabric for our SAN network. In particular we're looking at two N series switches. These are N2024 switches. So let's open them up and see what we got inside. So there's the switch, wrapped in plastic. Open this guy up. So, start off here in the front, we have the Dell logo. We have our model designation, like I said before, the N2024 switch. It has 24 gigabit ports, which is what we're looking at right there. We have a management port, which is a serial interface. We have two SFP Plus ports, 10 gig Ethernet ports. We have a LED, which is the stack number indication. In particular, with this config, we're going to have two switches in a stack. One of them will be the master, which will be designated uh, as the number one and the slave will be designated as number two. We have some diagnostic LEDs in the corner here and we have a USB port which is useful for firmware uploads, um, config uploads, config downloads, that type of stuff. On the side here we have holes for our rack mounting ears which we're going to utilize in this particular case. These two switches are going to end up in a two post rack. On the other side, corresponding holes. The bottom of the switch, all of the regulatory information that needs to be on these things. Fairly uh, unimportant for our purposes. On the back of the switch, we have two stacking ports, which we are going to utilize in this particular configuration, along with their status lights, their link and activity lights, for each particular port. You have the pullout for your service tag, your express service code, your primary switch MAC address, two non-removable system fans, a plate which is covering the slot for the redundant power supply unit that you could purchase for these particular switches. We have a little bar here in order for you to velcro your power cable to the switch so that way it doesn't fall out of the power which is right next to it covered up by this little sticker these take your typical you know computer power cord not like the power over ethernet models of these which require a special notched power cord and the top of the switch has the Dell logo and a brocade sticker. Let's look at what else is in the box. We have a serial, nine pin serial port with an RJ45 end for configuration and a Velcro strap rubber feet, ears, and corresponding screws for the ears as well as some cage nuts and screws for the cage nuts um, if you're going to put this in a you know square hole rack, square hole enclosure, as well as some screws for uh, you know your round hole racks and enclosures. And basically that's what's in that box. Let's look at our second box here. Packing material. We have two power cords for two switches. Extra long, which are nice. We have 
redundant copies of our safety, environmental, and regulatory information. And we have our stacking cables, one meter stacking cables. You can get these at uh, you know various lengths, but in particular for this configuration, we're using one meter stacking cables. We've got two of those. And at the bottom of the box, we have our second N2024 switch, which I'm not going to bore you guys with the unboxing of that since it's already something we just looked at. So let's get into the configuration of this and I'll show you guys how to configure it uh, to work efficiently according to the best practices guide that Dell has published. Um, let's get started. Okay, so here we are. Our switches are connected to the power. Um, their stacking cables are connected to the back of the switches. We have a serial port connected to switch one of the stack. And we have port 24 on the second switch um, connected via a Cat5 cable to the station that we're going to use to configure um, this particular setup. So let's take a look at the guide that we're following here. It can be found on Dell's Tech Center. And as you can see, there's a number of switches here um, from various manufacturers. You got um, Cisco, Brocade, HP. The document that we're going to be working with in particular is this guy right down here, this um, Dell Networking N2000 series document, which I have in this tab up top. Um, for a general overview of how everything's going to be connected here, we can look at this diagram. There's some differences with this diagram and the system that we're going to be putting together. For instance, they reference an R710 server in this configuration. Um, we are going to be using three R730 servers, just a slightly newer model. Um, the other thing that they mention is that they are going to use this lag group connected via the SFP plus ports. We are not going to have it set up that way. We are going to use the stacking cable. The other thing is that they mentioned they're going to use a PS series uh, a 6100. We are using a 4100. But all intents and purposes, this is a great diagram of how everything will be connected and plugged in. The other thing to mention is that we are not going to be using Chapter 2 of this guide. Chapter 2 of this guide references the fact that you're going to be using the FS, FSP Plus ports on the front of the switches. Instead, we are going to be using Chapter 3 of this guide, which is the stacked configuration. And here we have the tab, uh, you know, tab in Chrome for the product support page. Um, which, as you can see here, has the firmware for the Dell N2000 series switches. I can almost guarantee that the firmware that's on these switches right now is not the newest version. Typically, these things sit in warehouses, and um, by the time you get them delivered to your office, they're going to have an outdated firmware. So this is definitely something that we're going to want to put uh, you know, on these units. So let's get started. First thing we're going to do is we're going to connect via PuTTY to these switches. Um, PuTTY is a free tool, you know, just Google for PuTTY and you'll find the, you know, the download link. Grab that. We're going to connect via serial. And so let's look to see what COM port um, Windows has assigned our USB to serial port adapter. It looks like it's COM3. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to change that from COM1 to COM3. Um, the default settings that PuTTY has in there should be perfectly fine for this particular configuration. So, you know, let's go ahead and hit open and get connected to the switches. All right, there's the CLI. Okay, so now we're going to jump into configure mode. Um, go ahead and type that in on the window here. Actually, we got to get into enable mode first. So enable mode, now we're going to go into configure mode. And what we're going to do here is we are going to configure um, VLAN 1. We're going to configure VLAN 1 uh, for an IP on the SAN subnet. But first, let's look at the switch configuration that we have to work with. Um, quite a bit of stuff here 
um, you can see that the switch, if it had a DHCP server on the network, it would have got an IP. Um, we're going to, like I said, change that to be a static IP address. But you can also see that it shows some of the information um, regarding the stack members in there. And that was all handled by the switches as those um, stacking cables were, um, were connected to the back of them. So um, this is the command to add an IP address to VLAN number one. It's going to be uh, 10.0.20.7, which is just an IP that's uh, available on our SAN subnet. And we're going to use a slash 23 subnet mask. And that's assigned. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and assign an uh, an IP gateway, a default gateway um, for the unit. So in this particular case, uh, the default gateway is going to be 10.0.20.1, which is the IP address of our uh, core router. And after this, we're going to go ahead and we're going to set up a username and a password for HTTP access and we're also going to go ahead and set up an enable password for serial access, um, SSH access um, and the like. Uh, let's go ahead and, and do that. The command here to set up the um, HTTP server authentication you know is fairly long-winded. We're telling the um, HTTP server that we're going to use the local database with that particular command and then here we're going to go ahead and set up a user named administrator with a super secret password of password you know these type of things don't end up getting pushed into production it just makes it a whole lot easier uh, to work with it with a simple password while we're testing uh, things out we're setting it to privilege level 15 which is the highest um, security level and then we're going to go ahead and put an enable password in place also password just to keep things simple um, you know we're going to be going in and out of the configuration quite a bit so like I said to type in something fairly complicated it just gets a little bit cumbersome so once we're ready to put this into production we'll go ahead and switch that out and uh, you know we'll go ahead and make it as something a little bit more complex but right now let's go ahead and see what IP address we have on our local area uh, connection as we want to try to ping this switch make sure that uh, you know we're able to to see it and let's see here like I thought it's set for DHCP so let's set something on the local subnet and that IP should work we'll have um, the same subnet mask we'll throw the default gateway in place no need for DNS servers we don't have any of those on our SAN subnet, so we'll go ahead and save all of this out here. And we're going to open up a window. We're going to ping the IP, and voila, we're able to ping it. Perfect. Okay, so let's verify that we can get into the web interface uh, for the switch. Punch that IP in there. We go. And let's go ahead and put in the username of administrator and the password of password, which is that account that we created via the CLI. Make sure we're able to log in. Perfect. Go ahead and tell Chrome we don't want to save that password. And the next thing that we're going to do is just sort of continue along that guide, and we're going to jump into the CLI, and we're going to enable the iSCSI optimization feature. Um, the command to enable that iSCSI optimization feature is fairly straightforward. It's just iSCSI space enable. And what that's going to do is that's going to turn Jumbo Frames on for all of our ports. That's going to disable Unicast Storm. It's going to enable port fast um, on all of the ports, uh, spanning tree port fast. And then it's also going to configure flow control on all the ports just in one simple uh, you know command which is great and that's why we like to use these um, these N series switches so let's go ahead and punch that in here on the CLI 
And after we do that, it's going to ask us to confirm that we do indeed want to enable this. Okay, so even though it tells you that the iSCSI enable command is going to do all of this stuff magically for you, the documentation still says that these things should be manually um, configured. Let me spell receive uh, properly here. Uh, the manual or the best practices guide, I should say, tells you to go and manually set the, the flow control receive to on. And then it's going to ask for verification there. And turn that on. And then it also says that we should go and make sure that jumbo frames are sort of manually set, uh, you know, as well, even though the iSCSI enable command was supposed to do that. But first, let's look at the, um, let's look at the config and see if that iSCSI enable command actually did anything to the config. It doesn't really look like it. You know, we see our IP in there. We see our username, um, our password. We see, you know, that the enable password's been set. So not a whole lot has changed config-wise. Well, let's go ahead and change the, or I should say manually set the jumbo frame setting um, to what it's supposed to be. And then from there, we also are told within this best practices guide to set on every single one of the ports, uh, the spanning tree port fast mode, which is going to help those interfaces come up just that much faster. And really the only reason why they recommend you do this is because you're not supposed to have other switches connected to these ports. You know, these ports are going to mainly be used for your storage. Um, you're going to have your servers connected to it. So there really isn't any, um, or there shouldn't be any issues with a loop um, being created and so enabling port fast should be safe in this particular environment so let's go ahead and set the range of ports to be all of our gigabit uh, ports here um, we are not going to do the SFP plus ports in this particular setup we're not going to use the FSP ports uh, SFP plus ports at all um, but let's do it on the gig ports we're going to set port fast uh, to be enabled here and then we're gonna go ahead and jump in save this config before we get too far into things and uh, we make a mistake and do a reload and and uh, you know lose everything that we've been working on here so yeah, save I don't think that works in this particular switch we got to do a copy um, our running config to our startup config and let's see there we go okay and we're gonna go ahead and save that out so that way if we do reboot the switch we're in good shape okay Oh, yeah, we got to be out of the, the configure mode in order to run that command. So let's exit out. Let's go ahead and um, exit out of there. And then we'll do that same command here to make sure our config changes are saved. And yes, we'll go ahead and save those. Perfect. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to jump into the web interface. We're going to see what version of the firmware we're using, so let's drill down um, sort of in the menu structure here. Uh, like I said, I can almost guarantee that we're not uh, using the latest firmware version. It's very typical. And active images, yep. And sure enough, we're using 6.1.1.7, and the latest firmware is 6.2.1.6. .6. So let's go ahead and you know, upgrade this firmware. We're going to go ahead and look at the download here, extract the firmware itself. It's not that big. There it goes. Uh, well, there it goes slowly but surely. Surprising it's taking this long with an SSD, but uh, we'll just give it a second. There it goes. Um, jump in there. It's not done extracting yet here. Okay. Yeah, close that window. Okay, so there's the uh, the firmware update. It's about 22 meg. 
so not uh, super large or anything like that. And we're going to go ahead and jump into the, um, the file download. We're not going to use the USB flash drive um, to do this. We'll go to file download. We're going to tell it we're going to do firmware. We're going to transfer it via HTTP. I don't want to get into the process of setting up a TFTP server and all of that stuff. Go ahead and select the firmware to download to the switch. And we're going to let this sort of do its thing. I'm going to edit the video so we don't have to sit through this long um, update process. Uh, but I'll, I'll show you sort of the start of it. Um, I'm going to hit OK on that window there. It says it's going to take several minutes. And we know that. It doesn't take 18 minutes, but it does take um, a bit of time. You know, maybe, maybe three or four minutes. So I'll pick the video back up when we're ready. All right, so we're done. We're back. It says that the transfer was complete, so let's click OK. And we'll go look at the Active Images tab here, or Active Images page. And as you can see, the Active Image um, version has been updated, but the Active, um, the current Active Image is still the 6.1.1 dot seven. Um, also you can see that it updated unit one and it updated unit two which actually is one of the reasons why you would um, you would put the switches into a stacked configuration because as um, you know you've seen you got a single IP that single pane of glass and you're able to manage all of the switches in the stack um, through that single web interface so we need to reload um, the switch here to um, go ahead and use this current active image um, or to upgrade the current active image version to the 6.2.1.6 so let's go and reset it yeah and here we go and this takes I don't know maybe two minutes we're gonna do the whole stack go ahead and apply that and hit OK. There's nobody connected to it, obviously, so we are good to go. We already saved our config. Um, yep. And we're going to go take a look at this thing, restart in putty. And we'll go through the whole process. You'll get to see it um, from the beginning. And then there's a command that if you read the, um, the firmware install guide, there's actually a command to update the boot code. We'll jump in there. We'll take a look um, and put it on the side here so we can still see everything booting up. It's in this upgrading um, Dell networking file here. Let's, let's just uh, cancel this. Let's do a search for... Uh, for this so it's easier to find. Um, we're going to look for update boot code which is the command and well, we're not going to find that. Uh, let's spell that right here update boot yeah, okay um, update boot code and it should take us right to the section of the document that sort of describes um, what needs to be done so it says, you know, hey, after your switch is, you know, finished rebooting, which it looks like it's just finishing up doing that, then you want to do a show version, make sure that everything upgraded the way that it was supposed to, and then you um, should run the update boot code command in order to update the boot code and then reload the switch one more time. So there, the switches just came back up looks like it's waiting for unit number two to finish loading Let's see here give it a second there we go so we're gonna go ahead and go into enable mode that's the enable password that we set um, and now we're gonna go ahead and jump into that update boot code command super simple well, first let's do that show version. Yeah, so as we can see, um, you know, the active image and the currently active image have been upgraded to that 6.2.1.6, which is exactly what we were 
we were hoping for. And now we'll go ahead and update the boot code. There you go. Yes, we do want to update it. it. Takes just a couple of seconds to run through that command. Okay, and let's go ahead and do a reload. No reason to do anything with, um, you know, saving the running config to the startup config. Um, we didn't make any changes. We'll go ahead and reload the whole stack. All right, so now while this is booting up, what we're going to do next is we're going to jump in to the... Um, we're going to jump into the web interface and we're going to just configure some real general, uh, you know, general settings on the switch. They're not detailed in the best practices guide. This is just something that we like to do, um, you know, on on the switches, like um, you know, specify who's responsible for the switch, where the switch is located, um, the name of the switch. So that way, when you're you know remotely managing these things. You're a little bit more of you know more aware of what it is that you're working on, especially if you got a bunch of these in your environment. It just it just helps uh, you know to to have that stuff in place. We're also going to set some of the time zone um, settings S uh, SN, uh, SNTP, so that way we do get you know up up to date time and date information on these switches because when you're troubleshooting an issue and you're referencing logs on the SAN and you're referencing logs on the switch and you're referencing logs on the server you sort of want all of those things to be synchronized just to make it a whole lot easier to pinpoint what the problem um, you know the problem would be so let's see these switches are getting close okay looks like we're just waiting on um, one of the other switches to come up. There we go. So now we got everything up. We'll go ahead and re-log on to the web interface here. Punch in our password. And we're just gonna tell Chrome to not save that password. We're gonna jump into the general system information settings. Now I've done a bunch of these, so it's probably already saved in my history what I'm gonna type in here. So, yep. Yeah. That looks good. Um, technology department for the system contact. Just something fairly general in this particular case. And location, uh, server room. Yeah, that's perfect. We'll go ahead and apply those settings. And then we're going to jump into, yeah, there's the global config. There's our jumbo frame option that we set via the enable iSCSI uh, command. Um, there's time synchronization. So we're going to go in. And the first thing that we got to do is we got to add in uh, an SNTP server, but we're going to enable the client. You know, that's the, I guess, the first little page there. And then we'll jump in down here by the servers and go ahead. And we like to use DNS because we typically use us.pool.ntp.org. You can already see it there in our drop down list. Um, select that, go ahead and hit apply. And now we're going to go. Um, into the summertime configuration and we're going to set it um, yeah, not there there we go and we're going to set it so when daylight savings time uh, hits here in the United States that you know everything works the way um, that it's supposed to and that starts the um, the second week of March it's on a Sunday yep and it's at 2 a.m. So, 2 a.m., and then it ends, let's see, week one, a Sunday, and in November, and that also, um, I guess, ends at 2 a.m., so we're going to set that, and the offset is 60 minutes. Put all of that in place, we'll hit apply. Okay, so, yeah, look at that. Location is set to USA. It would have been nice to just be able to set it to USA to start off with, but I've been down that road, and when you set it to USA, it grays out everything else, and it um, doesn't let you apply the settings. You just keep getting an error. So let's go over and uh, let's go under IP addressing, uh, domain name servers. 
Uh, we don't have any on our SAN subnet, so we don't need to worry about those in this particular case, but we will put in a default domain name. There we go, hit apply. And then from here, there we go. We'll jump into our next setting that we're going to set up, which is the HTTPS um, server. So in order to do that, we got to generate a certificate. Um, even before you can enable it, right? You got to generate the certificate. But before you can do that, you got to put in your common name, your country, those type of things. So you know, bear with me why I punch in the information here. Um, put in the common name. There we go. We're in the U.S. So U.S. The duration. We're going to do you know uh, ten years. <laughs> Probably by the time we're ready to generate a new certificate, we'll be looking at new switches, hopefully. And I'm not sure if we need email. We'll just go to location, put in just some general information. Um, there we go, and 248-bit. we go, generate certificate. Yeah, yeah, we do need the email. So we're just going to put our support address in there. This is just something that's used internally anyway, so there we go. Generate certificate. They generate relatively um, quick, so let's just go here to, um, yeah, I think it's show all. We'll go into show all. Yep, there's the certificate. Certificate one. We'll go back to detail. We'll go ahead now and yeah, enable HTTPS using certificate number one. Go ahead and apply that. Voila. Okay, let's see if it works. Try to connect using HTTPS. Yeah, there we are, just what I would expect. Go ahead, proceed. Should take us to our login page. Put in our admin user and our password. There we are. HTTPS is working as expected. Um, we're going to go ahead, let's see, we got to enable SSH. Um, we also want to, um, I think, disable Telnet, and we want to disable, um, we want to disable HTTP. So let's go in, let's poke around for that here. Should be under, yeah, management security, um, Telnet server. So that's the first thing we'll do. We'll go ahead and set that to block and hit apply, that'll disable Telnet. And then we'll do this in the, um, in the CLI. I'll show you the command to um, disable the HTTP um, server. Ah, but first, SSH. Let's go ahead and enable SSH. We've already generated the certificate because we're using it for HTTPS. Yeah, the DSA should be fine. Um, let's go ahead and hit apply on that. Perfect. So SSH should be enabled. Now let's jump in the um, the CLI, and I'll show you. Um, well, let's verify. Let's verify SSH is actually working since we just enabled it. Uh, yep, yep. Let's go ahead and hit yes on that. There we go. Login. Password. Sure enough, SSH is working as expected. So we'll go ahead and we're going to disable HTTP, make this thing just that much more secure. And we'll close that out. Jump back in. Uh, we'll jump back into PuTTY here. There, there we go. Okay. And we're going to jump into enable mode, throw in our enable password. Um, yeah, spell it right. There we go. And configure mode. And the command to disable uh, the HTTP server is fairly simple. No IP HTTP server. We'll go ahead and we'll run that. And, well, before we get too far along, we, we better save our config. So we'll copy our running to our startup.
There we go. Okay, so now we're going to jump back in. We're going to verify that HTTP is indeed turned off. Go, and we shouldn't get anything. Perfect. So jump back, HTTP. I'll show you real quick um, in the GUI where you can do that, uh, the iSCSI enable command if you didn't want to do it through the CLI. Um, it's just a, a single drop-down box within uh, the, the web config. And so we'll just jump in there really fast. And then there's probably a couple of other little nitpicky things that we want to set. Um, maybe SNMP. Ah, and we need to set the um, spanning tree priority for this switch. So do that here. Um, jump in to the iSCSI settings under global configuration. Right there is the iSCSI enable command um, that we ran from the CLI. You just set that to uh, from disabled to enabled. It'll give you a little warning that it's going to make some fairly global configuration changes. You go ahead and you say yes to it and uh, you know it ends up enabling the flow control, enabling the port fast, setting the jumbo frames, all of those things that you know we already talked about. So let's go um, let's do two last things. We'll do the uh, the SNMP configuration. We like to monitor these things whenever possible. So that is just under um, let's see where exactly is that? I think it's under, under switching. No, there it is, SNMP. Uh, global parameters, and now we need um, communities. There we go. And we're going to go ahead and add a new community string. Just something relatively generic. We're going to tell it that all management stations can access this switch. Yeah, put in just a generic community string. We'll hit apply on that. Go back to the details tab make sure that our setting took effect. Perfect, perfect. Okay, now we're going to go down to um, switching and we're going to look at our spanning tree setup under global settings. You know, right now we're just using the default settings. Um, this particular switch is the root, but we're going to switch the priority to be zero, um, make it the lowest, lowest level um, switch, so that way it's always the root. We'll go ahead and apply these changes. There we go. And we'll refresh the page because it looks like um, you know the priority is still set pretty high. And there we go. So set to zero, just what we're looking for. So there was one thing that we forgot to do when we were configuring the summertime configuration, and that is the actual time zone configuration. Since we're in Nevada, we have an offset of minus 8, and that would put us on uh, PST time. So we're going to go ahead and put that in, save that change. And last but not least, we're going to go ahead and copy the running config to the startup config. So that way, all of the settings that we've got in place at this point persist after a reboot of the switch. There we go. All set. All right, so that's the end of part one. Make sure you check out the other parts of the series as they get posted. As you can see, here's my contact information if any of you would like to reach out to me via email um, or to any one of my team members at Integrity Systems, feel free. I'm going to also go ahead and leave the comments section open down below. So if I see any questions uh, posted down below, I'll try to get to them as soon as I can. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much.